Section 1. You will hear someone being asked their opinion of a new television station. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions 1 to 4. Excuse me, I'm sorry to bother you, but would you have time to answer a few questions? Uh, what's it about? We're doing some market research for a new television channel starting in two years' time. Uh, okay, why not? Lovely. We'll just work through this form. And if we could start with some personal background information? Sure. Right. If I could just have your age? 35. Right. Great. And your job? A uh, systems analyst. Uh, but for the form, uh, I don't know whether it would count as professional or business or, or what. What do you think? Uh, okay, it's more like business. Mm, fine. And would you mind my asking about your salary or... We can leave a blank. No, no, I don't mind. It's um, 40000 a year. Oh, thank you. Right. About your current watching habits, what would you say is your main reason for watching TV? Well, at work, I tend to read for information and what have you, mm. so I'd say that with TV, it probably just helps me relax and unwind. Fine. And how many hours a day, on average, do you watch TV? Hmm, not a lot, really. I should say just over an hour. You now have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 5 to 10. So what are the two main times of the day that you watch TV? Well, uh, a little around breakfast time, mm. and then it tends to be really late, um, 11 or even midnight, when I finish work. And what sort of programs do you go for? Some news bulletins, but I also really like to put my feet up with some of the old comedy shows. <laughs> Fine. And turning to the new channel, which type of programs would you like to see more of? Well, I certainly don't think we need any more factual programs, like news and documentaries. I think we need more about things like local information, you know, uh, providing a service for the community. And in the same vein, perhaps more for younger viewers. You know, good quality stuff. Uh-huh. And if you had to give the new director some specific advice when they set up the channel, what advice would you give them? I think I'd advise them to pay a lot of attention to the quality of the actual broadcast. You know, the sound system. People are very fussy these days about that. And in general, I think they ought to do lots more of these kinds of interview, you know, talking with their potential customers. Oh, I'm glad you think it's valuable. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly, yeah. Good. Okay. This will be a commercial channel, of course. But how often do you think it is tolerable to have adverts? Well, out of that list, I'd say every quarter of an hour. I don't think we can complain about that, as long as they don't last for ten minutes each time. <laughs> Quite. And would you be willing to attend any of our special promotions for the new channel? Yes, yeah, I'd be very happy to, as long as they're held here in my area. Okay, I'll make a note of that. And finally, may we put you on our mailing list? Well, um, I'd prefer not, except for the information about the promotion you mentioned. Can I have your name and address? Of course. Um, here's my card. Oh, Lovely. And thank you very much for your time, and we look forward to seeing you. Yes, indeed. Um, thanks. That is the end of Section 1. 
You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Part 2 You will hear part of a radio program about the opening of a new local sports shop. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Now we go to Jane, who is going to tell us about what's happening in town this weekend. Right, thanks Andrew. And now on to what's new. And do we really need yet another sports shop in Bradcaster? Well, most of you probably know Sports World, the branch of a Danish sports goods company that opened a few years ago. It's attracted a lot of custom, and so the company has now decided to open another branch in the area. It's going to be in the shopping centre to the west of Bradcaster, so that will be good news for all of you who found the original shop in the north of the town hard to get to. I was invited to a special preview, and I can promise you, this is the ultimate in sports retailing. The whole place has been given a new minimalist look with the company's signature colours of black and red. The first three floors have a huge range of sports clothing as well as equipment. And on the top floor, there's a cafe and a book and DVD section. You'll find all the well-known names as well as some less well-known ones. If they haven't got exactly what you want in stock, they promise to get it for you in 10 days unlike the other store, where it can take up to 14 days. They cover all the major sports, including football, tennis and swimming. But they particularly focus on running, and they claim to have the widest range of equipment in the country. As well as that, a whole section of the third floor is devoted to sports bags, including the latest designs from the States. If you can't find what you want here, it doesn't exist. Before you hear the rest of the programme, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. The shop will be open from 9am this Saturday and if you go along to the opening then you'll have the chance to meet the national 400 metres running champion Paul King who's coming along to open the shop and he will be staying around until about midday to chat to any fans who want to meet him and sign autographs. Then there will be a whole range of special attractions all weekend. There will be free tickets for local sporting events for the first 50 customers, and also a special competition open to all. Just answer 15 out of 20 sports questions correctly to win a signed copy of Paul King's DVD, Spring Tips, while the first person to get all the questions correct gets a year's free membership of the Bradcaster Gym. All entrants will receive a special sports calendar with details of all Bradcaster fixtures in the coming year. One of the special opening offers is a fitness test. 
a complete review of your cardiac fitness and muscle tone, actually done in the shop by qualified staff. This would normally cost £30, but is available at half price for this month only. There are only a limited number of places available for this, so to make a booking, phone 560341. In addition, if you open an account, you get lots more special offers, including the chance to try out equipment at special open evenings. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 3. You will hear a conversation between four students, Lynn, Thomas, Sophie and David. They are talking about one of their tutors, Marlena. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Thomas, let's not go to the lab. Let's just stay here in the student lounge and drink tea and review the chapter. You know we can't do that. We've a responsibility to turn up and make sure our tutor has understood the week's lectures. If we don't go, no one will ever even realise she's got the theories all muddled up. Oh, really? Sophie, it's awful. Marlena just opens her mouth and I'm confused. Really, she... Marlena's our tutor. Yeah, I gathered that. You lot have got no manners. I was in the middle of saying something. <sighs> She'll say things that make no sense whatsoever. And I'm thinking I've misunderstood something. And I'm looking around the room and everyone has these looks on their faces of... Disbelief and merriment. <laughs> Maybe you do, Thomas, but we're not all geniuses. Really, I'll, I'll be so worried that I've got it all wrong. Then people start asking questions and by and by, we figure out that she's mixed something up. That's too bad. It's not a good situation at all. But surely you're exaggerating a bit, Lynn. No, it's awful. I don't know how she got through her undergraduate studies, much less got accepted as a postgrad here. You'd think our professor would have some idea about her abilities. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Marlena's an unusual name. Is she English? She's Spanish, David. She's got a really strong accent. Really, that's a lot of the problem, I think. I don't think she's thick. She just doesn't communicate very well. I'm not sure she understands us completely, especially when someone's joking around. <laughs> and we do tease her a bit, I must admit. What a nightmare. I'd hate to have you in my class if I was a tutor, Tom. As long as you're clever, Sophie, you'd have nothing to worry about. But you've just said she's not thick. I think I've met her, actually. I think we had a class together maybe last year. She was really shy and quiet, hardly spoke the whole term. But she, she was always smiley and friendly. She seemed nice, actually, and I think she got one of the highest marks in the class. Maybe you've all picked on her so much that she's so nervous that she can't think clearly. Ever think of that? 
But we don't need to babysit. We need help. It's a difficult subject. Has anyone ever gone up and asked her for help individually? Yes, actually, I have. I couldn't understand one of the formulas in the first chapter. The theory about why it worked just made no sense to me. So I went and asked her about it, and she cleared it right up. She was very helpful. She's not thick. I already said that. She's just so much fun to torment, right? Yep, that's it. Lynn, if you're having trouble with something, why don't you make an appointment to meet with her individually and see if she can help you that way? Maybe you'd see a different side of her. I reckon she just hates getting up in front of the class, and I can hardly blame her. <sighs> yes, I could try that, I suppose. Guys, the, the tutors aren't old academics who've been teaching for 30 years. They're just like us, two years down the road if we're clever enough to continue with our education. I know I'd be mortified to get up in front of you lot, and I don't think I'll feel that differently in a couple of years' time. You know, we're far more experienced as students than they are as teachers. Hmm, you're right, David. Really, it's more like one of our mates is trying to help us out. But, you know, our mates aren't so frightened of us. Yeah, but you aren't so horrible to your mates, are you? That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Part 4. You will hear an anthropology student giving a presentation on spiral path designs known as labyrinths. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Labyrinths have existed for well over 4,000 years. Labyrinths and labyrinthine symbols have been found in regions as diverse as modern-day Turkey, Ireland, Greece and India. There are various designs of labyrinth, but what they all have in common is a winding spiral path which leads to a central area. There is one starting point at the entrance, and the goal is to reach the central area. Finding your way through a labyrinth involves many twists and turns, but it's not possible to get lost, as there is only one single path. In modern times, the word labyrinth has taken on a different meaning, and is often used as a synonym for a maze. A maze is quite different, as it is a kind of puzzle with an intricate network of paths. Mazes became fashionable in the 15th and 16th centuries in Europe and can still be found in the gardens of great houses and palaces. The paths are usually surrounded by thick, high hedges so that it's not possible to see over them. Entering a maze usually involves getting lost a few times before using logic to work out the pattern and find your way to the centre and then out again. There are lots of dead ends and paths which lead you back to where you started. The word maze is believed to come from a Scandinavian word for a state of confusion. This is where the word amazing comes from. Labyrinths, on the other hand, have a very different function. Although people now often refer to things they find complicated as labyrinths, this is not how they were seen in the past. The winding spiral of the labyrinth has been used for centuries as a metaphor for life's journey. 
It served as a spiritual reminder that there is purpose and meaning to our lives, and helped to give people a sense of direction. Labyrinths are thought to encourage a feeling of calm, and have been used as a meditation and prayer tool in many cultures over many centuries. The earliest examples of the labyrinth spiral pattern have been found carved into stone, from Sardinia to Scandinavia, from Arizona to India to Africa. In Europe, these spiral carvings date from the late Bronze Age. The Native American Pima tribe wove baskets with a circular labyrinth design that depicted their own cosmology. In ancient Greece, the labyrinth spiral was used on coins around 4,000 years ago. Labyrinths made of mosaics were commonly found in bathhouses, villas, and tombs throughout the Roman Empire. In northern Europe, there were actual physical labyrinths designed for walking on. These were cut into the turf or grass, usually in a circular pattern. The origin of these walking labyrinths remains unclear, but they were probably used for fertility rites, which may date back thousands of years. Eleven examples of turf labyrinths survive today, including the largest one at Saffron Walden, England, which used to have a large tree in the middle of it. More recently, labyrinths have experienced something of a revival. Some believe that walking a labyrinth promotes healing and mindfulness, and there are those who believe in its emotional and physical benefits, which include slower breathing and a restored sense of balance and perspective. This idea has become so popular that labyrinths have been laid into the floors of spas, wellness centers, and even prisons in recent years. A pamphlet at Colorado Children's Hospital informs patients that walking a labyrinth can often calm people in the midst of a crisis. And apparently, it's not only patients who benefit. Many visitors find walking a labyrinth less stressful than sitting in a corridor or waiting room. Some doctors even walk the labyrinth during their breaks. In some hospitals, patients who can't walk can have a paper finger labyrinth brought to their bed. The science behind the theory is a little sketchy, but there are dozens of small-scale studies which support claims about the benefits of labyrinths. For example, one study found that walking a labyrinth provided short-term calming, relaxation and relief from anxiety for Alzheimer's patients. So what is it about labyrinths that makes their appeal so universal? Well, that is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four.